This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 11 o'clock block on a given Wednesday. I'm here with Craig Thomas. He's an MD. He's the uh, chief, the chief person at the Hawaii Emergency Physicians Associates. Um, and he knows about emergency rooms and he knows about medicine. He comes down here and do, does the show. And I'm kind of guest hosting today. And uh, Craig is, is uh, Craig's going to be my my guest. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be good. So much to talk about in medicine. But let's start with access. I mean, you and I were chatting about this. You know, um, in the Bar Association, among the judges and the members of the Supreme Court who uh, administer uh, the judiciary branch. So here in wait, Hawaii. are we talking Obama judges or uh, <laughs> never? I couldn't help it, and I won't do it again. Uh, <laughs> we 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 have a big issue on that here yeah. in Hawaii. Nay. But, but anyway, the big, you know, the Chief Justice's big initiative these days, Mark Rechtenwall, uh, is access to justice. Yes. Because he feels you can't have a, you know, a working society, and I agree with him, um, unless you have access to justice by everyone. And then the problem is legal services have gotten more expensive, uh, and they're unpredictable. You go to see a lawyer, you don't know what it's going to cost you, you know. It's very rare that you can get a flat sum and know <laughs> walking in the door what this, what this mission is going to cost. And, um, you know, and, and there's a parallel, of course, not a perfect parallel, but a parallel with medicine, uh, where, you know, what we hear from Washington confuses us, what we hear about Obamacare and all the other possibilities, what we worry about Medicare and Medicaid, and, and gosh, I mean, it, you know, who, if you stop somebody in the street, are they going to know how medicine is going to be provided? Are they going to know the level of access that they have and will have in their lives? So just as access to justice is important on the legal side of things, access to medicine is critical in even more profound ways in the medical side of things. I would agree. Although I would actually say, let's broaden it. It should be uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of health. Because yeah, yeah. medicine is only an element of health. Uh, I like your analogy to the legal system. And I would point out that uh, if I need a lawyer in some criminal uh, way, uh, if I can't pay for it, I get a public defender. Now, there are definitely issues around that system. And there have been some famous, uh, I think, poor representations. But overall, I get one. That's not true in healthcare. And I would argue that health is every bit as important as uh, freedom, which is, of course, what the criminal justice system is. In a way, about. it's the same thing. It is. I think that's true. And the United States is unique. Of the uh, 20 most economically advanced countries, uh, we and South Africa. Um, are unique in that we don't have universal coverage in some way. And I don't mean it has to be single payer, although that's certainly a model. Um, but there are many models. Uh, but the situation is, if you are a resident in one of those countries, uh, you have access to basic health care, regardless of your ability to pay. And we don't. Uh, I think that's terrible. Well, it's a moral question, isn't it? I mean, for example, if I, if I know, and I do, and anyone knows what happens to you if you don't have health care with a given health problem, you're going to be suffering. You're going to be dying. You're going to be having a terrible, terrible time every moment of every day if you don't have health care. And to knowingly, as a matter of government, as a matter of industry, you know, go into that and allow millions of people not to have health care, it's, it's, it's morally reprehensible. In a, in a way, it's morally criminal uh, that we have this problem that we don't take care of our people, our brothers and sisters. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, not everyone does, of course. I was uh, stunned, I think is a fair statement. Uh, back in 2010, you may remember that there was, uh, this was sort of in the legislative process of the Affordable Care Act, and the legislators all went home to their town halls over the summer, which were raucous, and which presaged the red wave which occurred at the, those falls elections. And at some of those meetings, 
there was a chant of let them die. Ah, wow. Which I thought was stunning because wow. the, the, and this chant was in response to the question of what if somebody collapses on a sidewalk or, because this happens. People need health care and uh, crowds are a dangerous thing. I don't believe that in fact most people believe that. But our policies are not particularly conducive to anything else. Um, it is true, I'm an emergency physician, so I know this very well. Uh, it is true that uh, if someone collapses on a sidewalk or needs health care for any reason and goes to an emergency department, they will receive care, regardless of anything else, severity of condition, ability to pay, or anything like that. The Hippocratic Oath is operating there. Well, that and the legal system, namely, there's a, <laughs> I, we all bought into it uh, because of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, but embarrassingly, uh, there had to be a, something called EMTALA, which stands for Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And this thing came out in the 80s, and why? It's because hospitals would pick and choose who to treat who came to their emergency department. So somebody came in in labor, that's the active labor part. Oh, you got the insurance? You know what, that county hospital down the road, 45 minutes away, uh, can take care of you. Terrible. That's, that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, definitely not in keeping with the Hippocratic Oath. And so we see everybody. We're happy to see everybody. I hope we provide excellent care to everybody. We do our best. We are not a good venue for chronic care or health prevention, which has many forms. It could be just blood pressure monitoring or vaccinations, which I firmly believe in, or many other things. Or even, you know, how's your uh, diet and exercise program going and how sure. can we, uh, how's your mental health? Those kinds of things. We don't do that. Um, we're not good at that. So I'm happy we're a safety net. I would not purport that this is an unfunded safety net. After all, uh, people who don't pay, everybody else we see pays for them. So it's not like we're saving money doing well, this. How does that work? Somebody comes into an emergency room that you, that you operate. Yes. And he has no insurance and no money. Yes. And, he, and he's, he's a street person. He's a homeless. Oh, uh, there are lots of people with no insurance and no money. That's who true. Aren't they homeless. don't have to be street people. It's yeah. true. Um, okay, it comes in and let's say it's clearly an emergency room situation. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, if, but... If he or she comes in and wants to be treated, or even is sort of aimed in our direction, we need to welcome them in, and we do. So now you, you provide, uh, what, you know, what I, I imagine it's expensive because it's urgent. You provide urgent care. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't be conservative about this. You've, You've got to get right in there and do something, especially when life life is at stake, um, and and that's expensive. And you know, the doctors, the nurses, the equipment, the drugs, supplies, the space in the emergency. I mean, you could just, as a business matter, tick down all those expenses, and some of them are extraordinary expenses that you don't have in an ordinary business, and you have to absorb that. Now, what you said a minute ago was, well, we all wind up sharing that cost. How does that work? So you've given me so many places I could go. Uh, <laughs> that's my and job. We, that's perfect. <laughs> so I would like, a, like to surface, circle back to the expense versus charge issue because it's not as obvious as it's assumed. Well, I'll just give you an example. If you come in with an ankle sprain and you're one additional patient on all the patients I'm seeing, the marginal cost, both for me, it's not going to take very long to figure out if you need an x-ray or not, or the hospital, which has, as you say, many expenses associated with being able to do a resuscitation, and they have a blood bank, and they have an on-call panel. But there are really a lot of expenses. Uh, but none of those are impacted by the fact that you may need an x-ray or a splint or not. Um, the marginal cost is that. On the other hand, we act like you are expensive. Conversely, the person who is pancaked on the street after the Harley Davidson event, that person is very costly. And we definitely have a more expensive charge for them, 
but it doesn't reflect the actual resources sort of uh, engaged to deal with that person. Is there a, is there a rate structure? Oh, of course. Oh, well, I shouldn't say of course. Yes. Um, so to circle to your question exactly, how does that work? Uh, we see everyone. We provide care not based on their ability to pay, uh, which is not be confused with getting a bill later. That's important. Um, getting a bill and paying it are two separate things. Well, that's also true. <laughs> and the, I don't think we want to go completely down the rabbit hole of either, I mean, I'll mention it, but either the fee or the uh, contracted payment structure, except to say that fees, which are preposterous, are designed to capture all the contracted potential payment levels. So they're high. Yeah. On the other hand, your insurance, whatever it is, has likely contracted with us an agreed rate. That's what we get paid. If you have no insurance, you get the fee, which is high. Uh, Higher than what insurance would pay. Generally. Uh, well, if it's lower than what insurance would pay, we've screwed up. So in other words, I don't know, let's say insurance would pay 150 bucks and we bill 130, You're we just left 20 on bucks on the table. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's set up the way it is. And it's, it's honestly kind of ridiculous. So you get a, a bill for, I don't know what, $600 and your insurance pays 155 and we accept it. Um, and you, you leave the rest on the table. Well, it's You're not, not it's, it's, it, we're not, yeah, it's, it's, it's left on the table is one term. It's a contracted adjustment would be the more, uh, okay, fair. but it, the, we don't get the money. That's can, okay. Can I escalate this to, uh, and this may not be an emergency room phenomenon, but so uh, a fellow goes in a hospital and he has uh, some kind of operation. Make it an operation he really has to have right now. Okay. And it's a, you know, it's a, it, it keeps him off his feet in the hospital for three, four, five, six days, whatever it is. Okay. Um, he gets out of the hospital and he gets a bill and it's for $250,000. <laughs> so he got a bargain. Okay. You know, you hear these stories oh, all the time. Oh, no, no. All the time. They aren't false. So go on. <laughs> well, you know, is that a fee? Is that is that a real reflection of the of the cost of doing that business? So now <laughs> 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 now we, remember I said we needed to talk about uh, cost versus charge? So that's an interesting question because what I've learned about accounting, what, what, what is, uh, I think Samuel Clemens supposed to have said, something like there's liars and then there's accountants or something like that. He might have put politicians <laughs> in, but I'll put accountants. Um, the... Um, uh, cost allocation is difficult. I'm not making excuses. I'm saying it is difficult. On the other hand, the ankle sprain should get a splint and maybe an x-ray, maybe. And maybe should get nothing. That might be the best care. Yeah. The $250,000 surgery, it's a heart transplant, maybe that really does reflect the cost. But if it was uh, you know, uh, laparoscopic gallbladder, Probably needed to happen. A very useful, in fact, almost miraculous procedure. People used to be laid up for months. You know, after an open procedure, you were like, don't lift anything for six weeks and move slow after that. And now it's like, back to work in a couple days. Um, and you would not be in the hospital four or five days. It's magic. They're not $250,000, but I, I don't know what they are. Yeah. Uh, well, but the overall expense of the hospital is allocated in some way to that surgery, and the allocation is definitely a problem. The heart transplant maybe should have gotten more. The laparoscopic gallbladder, which the hospital does many, uh, should get less. Uh, and there's very little scrutiny to, is this the most cost-effective way of doing it? Mm. Because the doctors in particular are one step removed. We have the insurance in between. The hospitals are also one step removed. They have the insurance in between. So you, the patient, are here, the insurer's in the middle, and the provider 
whether it's the hospital or the doctor, is here. That insulates us. That's not good. Uh, it, well, here's another way of looking at it. You asked, is 250000 reasonable? I said, depends on what was done, but almost surely there's plenty of money that could be saved there without impacting outcomes. Yeah. And, At the same time, I think we have to recognize that new technologies, magic technologies, um, you know, have to get their due. And uh, risky technologies have to get their due. They do, but we make the assumption that new is always better and uh, it's almost always more expensive, but it's not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. And the cost of healthcare in the U.S., whether it's drugs, or equipment or procedures uh, is very high. We actually provide about the same amount of actual care, uh, but at a, a near doubling of the price. Interesting. So uh, I want to go one step further on this. Uh, we're going to take a break, but I, I want to sort of, uh, you know, create a cliffhanger here. Um, okay. So, so here we have this expensive procedure, whether it's in the emergency room or, or extended visit in the hospital, um, and uh, the fellow doesn't have insurance, can't pay, but it's a moral matter, and is that that statute you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the medical community provides that. And I guess the question is, uh, what happens to the individual who gets that bill? Uh, what happens to the people who ultimately wind up supporting that bill, paying that bill, when he can't? Um, and how does that affect all of us now? This is a complex question, I'm sorry. Now and in the future, because it's got to be handled it's got to be adjusted, and it could have, you know, with this administration trying to pull back on Medicaid, Medicare, what have you, and Social Security also, um, you know, what's the, what's the ultimate social result in terms of access to medicine, you know, in the foreseeable future? Now, that's a complex question, and that's why I'm giving you one minute to think about it. Craig Thomas, MD, <laughs> the leader of the Hawaii Emergency Physicians Associates. Could I have right a few back. more minutes? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required. And you get to actively participate in your care. Choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Craig Thomas, and he's had, I guess he's had enough time to wrap around that extraordinary question <laughs> I posed as a cliffhanger before the break. <clears throat> so what do you think? How does, that, how does that work? I mean, how does the, you know, the bill get paid, and how does the payment of the bill affect our society now and in the future? So for the individual, it's a real problem. First of all, don't forget, they got the full freight bill. Now, it doesn't mean we won't negotiate with them as an emergency service provider, and the hospitals do the same, but they get a shocking bill. That's the first problem. That's worth bearing in light that uh, the leading cost of personal bankruptcy in the U.S. is medical bills. So that's bad news. At the same time, you mentioned before the show that 18% of the GDP is into health care. Yes, and that is we pay approximately double per capita uh, in dollars, dollars per capita uh, than the rest of the uh, sort of high income world. And the problem is our metrics aren't very good. Longevity, we're middle of the pack. Uh, disease burden, we're middle of the pack. Coordination of care, we're at the bottom of the pack. So you could say it's okay to pay 18% and climbing, I should point out, uh, but only if you're getting great product. So back to our individual, if he or she has no resource, uh, not much happens to them. If he or she does have resource but not insurance, they end up with a big bill. Those are those horror stories you hear about. And they may be able to negotiate, and I recommend that, um, 
with the various vendors, mm -hmm. and there are going to be a bunch. There'll be the emergency doctor, the radiologist, the hospital, the uh, surgeon. Many parts to that. Bill. Yeah, they're complicated, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, there's got to be a more streamlined way of doing that. It's called single payer. Anyway, um, uh, are there advocates but, that you can hire? Oh, there are. Is there somebody to, to advocate for, I mean, even the medicine, uh, to one, one treatment, one, one um, you know, solution, cure, or, or another, and then ultimately negotiate on the bill? Uh, so you're actually dealing with two different elements. Uh, the first is, and so the decision of what therapy, where, by whom, pros and cons, that should be you and your doctor. Or if you come to the emergency department, you and me. Uh, it's very difficult because the no, even though presentations have many similarities, rarely are they, they're never identical. And usually they're different in meaningful ways, both medically but also what's important to you. Um, and that impacts. Separately there's, and it's not really separate because cost is part of quality, uh, it really is. If you spend money on one thing, you're not spending it on something else and that could infect health more. Um, so there are people who help navigate that also and most uh, billing entities will talk. They, no, one, no one wants to bankrupt anybody, you don't get paid. Um, but besides that, it's ugly. We're here to try to improve health. So back to your question, the individual gets stuck with a big bill. There's only two ways out of that. Either they got no money, in which case they don't pay, in which case the cost of that care, whether it's the physician's salary or uh, the hospital's supplies or their overhead, their floor space, their nurses, all of that gets shifted to everyone else who's using the facility. Because the, the big bill that we talked about actually includes payment for somebody else's bill as well. Well, it's, yes, there, we talked about cost allocation. There is the cost of providing uncompensated care. And by definition, it's uncompensated. That means uh, if you're going to provide that care, the money has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the other people using the service. So it's there's no free ride. It's, it's very mm -hmm. ironic, you know, you talk about that town hall meeting, uh, you know, let them die yeah. on the street and all that. Well, we don't really do that. We take care of them. And, and then the, the fellow says, well, I'm not paying for the other guy's medical condition. It's his fault. No, well, he actually is paying for the other guy's medical you condition. You are correct. <laughs> and besides that, uh, we're all going to, as far as I can tell, no one left this, this earth alive. So we're all going to have medical conditions. And most of us have already got pre-existing ones. And we've lived long enough. We surely do. So, uh, so that was nuts. Um, yes, we're all paying. Of course, there's no free ride. But one of the problems is we're paying for episodic care. Some of the most important contributors to health are the ongoing, how shall we call it, uh, supporting a healthy life and dealing with problems early. Quality of life <laughs> steps you can take. Absolutely, and in fact, it's a minor aside, but if you want to be healthy, there's a whole list of things that you can do. We all know what they are. Doesn't mean we can do them necessarily. Um, they don't have anything to do with medicine, hardly ever. Maybe blood pressure monitoring, but that's about it. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the, where medicine comes in handy is when you break your leg or have a heart attack or things like that. And so we provide that expensive episodic care for things that could quite likely have been either delayed or perhaps prevented entirely. And that's crazy. So putting aside, you know, the whole business about reforming the medical care system and all that, um, you know, the whole Hillary Clinton's efforts and Obama's efforts, and all, putting it all aside, um, how can you, and to me, this, this, the same process is in so many other places in our society, how can you incentivize people to take those steps that would make them less of a risk medically, less of an expense to the community medically? How can you incentivize them to do that? Is it happening now? Is there a way it could happen you know, more, more effectively in the future? If I really knew the answer, <laughs> I'd be preaching it from the top of a mountain. Uh, are there some obvious things that would help? 
Yes, removing barriers to access to preventive care would clearly be one. Uh, the other thing is I think that a large part of our trouble is the marriage of capitalism and health care. Because there's, there's no financial incentive. You, you can't sell sit-ups, OK? I can do my sit-ups, or I can't, but nobody's going to make any money off of it. It's going to be on the final exam. You can't sell sit-ups. It's a, it's, a, it's a basic truth. If, if I could sell sit-ups and then somebody would do them for me and I got the benefit, I'd do it. No, I want no, to see that. Many of the, the literature is quite clear that most of the, the major impacts on health are related to simple non-medical stuff. And we all know them. It's mostly exercise and diet and uh, a few other healthy activities and some basic screening. And this reminds me of a call I had from HMSA, a series of calls, mm -hmm. um, a couple, three years ago. And a little lady on the phone would identify herself as a nurse. Yep. And she would say, I'm, I'm here to check up on you. I'd like to know how you're doing. And, uh, you know, we have all your medical records. We're here at HMSA. But uh, I'd like to know who you're seeing, what are your problems, what do you, how do you present your, claim, your complaints, mm -hmm. uh, and your lifestyle. You know, and I, I'd like to follow you, they would say. I'd like to follow you, I'd like to know how you're doing. It was like preventative care on the telephone. So first, I'm crushed. They never called me. <laughs> What's the deal? Touch. They like you, they don't like me. <laughs> Maybe yeah. a big risk. <laughs> uh, what HMSA is doing with that is trying to shape your behavior to improve your health and save them money. And if they really, I'm, not, not, I'm delighted they're doing that. Our interventions like that so far have not been very successful. And, uh, and speaking personally, I like to eat a lot. I'm not that big in exercise. Uh, that's a problem. Um, and so uh, we are not very, we know what works on a sort of population basis how we can minimize the risk of heart attacks, uh, how we can actually maximize the chance bad things don't happen and you will live a long time. It appears that exercise and fitness are associated with a whole number of good outcomes. How do we incentivize people to do that? I don't know, but it's pretty clear if you pay by the procedure or by the drug, you are doing the opposite. And that's actually a real problem. Well, you know, I was thinking that if you wanted to crank in some kind of uh, incentive there, you would say that if you listen to that lady, if you take these steps to improve the quality of your health and life, not, not medical intervention steps, mm -hmm. just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, do the right thing. And, and, and people will consult with you free in this model I'm designing. Yep. But if, you know, if you don't do those things, it's hard to decide determine whether you don't do them or do do them. And uh, you can put some metrics on it. Okay, you make on. some metrics on yeah. it. Your, your, your cost of medical insurance is less if you do them properly. Mm -hmm. Your cost is more if you don't do them properly. But I'm not sure I see that as an incentive. I mean, people really don't respond to that. That's the pro so you're talking the car insurance model. And uh, that's a model. And in fact, it would reflect sort of the capitalistic reality. And HMSA would do it, except that I don't think there's much evidence it works. There's another difference. Car insurance is required if you drive a car. <laughs> uh, health insurance is not universally available, is not required, and we all have bodies. So leaving aside what insurance adjustment affect your behavior, what do you do about the person who has no insurance and no money? So that's the problem. And I, I would say the first thing you do is you cover everybody with basic services. I would have said the same thing. I think the government has to be more active and more kind. The government has to step in at government expense, which is our expense, and it has to take care of us at, at a certain level for certain things. Yes. And, and that will make us healthier so that the other things the bad things won't happen so quickly. That way, yes. And the other thing you could do in those basic services are some of the things we know improve health. And research it. Do pilot projects. Figure out how you can get people to go uh, walk in 15,000 steps a day or something like that. Uh, and then see what happens. And as we learn more, uh, change what we do. We have a long way to go. 
Yes. But it comes back to, you know, your original concept, actually, Craig, is there's much more about this than medicine. That's oh. why we call the show much more than medicine. There you go. It's, uh, now, medicine is a small part of overall health. It's real. It's important. But it's a small part. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Craig Thank Thomas. you. Aloha.